and online at nhpr.org. From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Laura Canoy, and this is The Exchange. In official parlance, it's called the General Court, but we call it the State Legislature. And in New Hampshire, it's big. 400 House members and 24 senators. Right after New Year's Day, they all convened for the 166th session and have already been discussing issues from mental health to school safety to drinking water. Today in the exchange, what's on the new legislature's agenda? A panel of House and Senate leaders is here, and let's get you into our conversation. What do you want to make sure state lawmakers consider this year? Let us know. Our email, exchange at nhpr.org. Once again, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange or give us a call 1-800-892-6477. And in addition to listening to our program today, you can watch it on Facebook Live. Our guests are Representative Dick Hinch. He's House Republican leader and a Republican from Merrimack. And Representative Hinch, good to see you. Happy New Year. Good morning. Also with us, Senator Chuck Morse. He's Senate Republican leader and a Republican from Salem. Senator Morse, thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Also with us, Representative Steve Shirtliff. He's Speaker of the House and a Democrat from Pennacook. Representative Shirtliff, welcome back. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And also with us, Senator Donna Susi. She's Senate President and a Democrat from Manchester. And Senator Susi, thank you also for being here. We appreciate Good it. Good morning and thank you. Well, all of you, it is the first year in a two-year session. So as you all know, it's a budget year. So let's start off with that. What, in your opinion, needs immediate attention in the state budget? And Senator Susi, I'll go to you first. Um, I think there are a few issues. There are actually uh, some pieces of legislation that we're going to introduce that will work their way into the budget. Um, But two areas in particular I would focus on are mental health, mental health rates, and ensuring that we have a process so that people are not spending days upon days in emergency rooms. Um, In addition, uh, I think given the recent report about the state of DCYF and children, um, we have legislation to add immediately some caseworkers to that division so that they can begin the process of hiring even before the next budget is enacted. Okay, and it's interesting that you mentioned those two. We'll definitely talk about those later because we did get feedback from our listeners on those two issues. Um, How about you, Senator Morse? In the budget, what do you think needs immediate attention? Well, first of all, I'm not going to serve on finance, so the uh, immediate attention, as far as I'm concerned, is in the drafting of the budget. I I think we need to draft a budget that's balanced as usual. I think all the subject matters that are going to come up today will be debated intensely, and I think first and foremost, we've made it very clear that we're going to continue to fight this drug and alcohol problem we have in the state of New Hampshire, um, and we're going to create a balanced budget. And We're going to drive this economy in the state of New Hampshire, and I hope to participate in that part of it. Speaker Shirtliff, how about you? For me personally, and I think for the state, uh, mental health will be number one. You know, as someone who grew up in Concord and remembered when the New Hampshire hospital, every one of those buildings would fill with someone with some form of mental health. Um, And then we did the right thing in 81 when we uh, deinstitutionalized and gave them the counseling and housing they needed. But somewhere along the line, we've dropped the ball. And instead of going for being the model for other states, now we see the problems we're having with people being bedded in uh, hospitals and not getting the treatment they really need. Okay. And how about you, Representative Hinch? What do you think absolutely needs attention in the budget? Well, the first thing that needs attention is we have to make sure the budget is a conservative budget. Um, you know, it is easy to just throw money at certain things, but I think we have to um, make sure that we're holding – um, the different areas of responsibility, uh, holding the different areas responsible for the spending. Um, I agree with the comments that have been said so far relative to, uh, you know, mental health, drug, alcohol, and things like that. You know, we also have school safety. We have um, a public safety. There's a, you know, road infrastructure. There are a number of things, all of which are going to be um, looking for uh, attention within the budget. And so it's prioritizing is, is you know, the key to having an effective budget. But it needs to be conservative. It needs to be, you know, within our spending and not just go out and inflate revenues for the sake of spending. Um, well, and I'm glad you mentioned that point because um, inflating revenues, that's how it gets started, right? Representative Hinch, people make estimates as to how many revenues they're going to be. And then they try and 
fit in various programs and responsibilities within those estimates. And there's always a fight over whether the right. estimates are too optimistic or That's not. That's right. And, you know, the interesting thing is that for the past four years, um, and I'll speak only for the House, um, the the revenue estimates have been a unanimous vote, bipartisan. Um, and so I, I think as long as we're able to have realistic revenue estimates uh, and not inflate it just so that we can spend more, um, I think that's the key. Well, and Senator Morse, I did want to ask you about that too. You know, um, Governor Sununu said in his inaugural address and has hinted, good times might not last forever here in New Hampshire, so let's not overspend. Uh, are there areas of the budget in general or programs, Senator Morris, that you think either could be reduced or maybe the state doesn't need to do these anymore? We can send these to local communities and so forth. Well, I've always been a firm believer you have to go through that test in every budget. So as the budget leaves the governor and goes to the House and comes to the Senate, um, I think that process always works. I, I think our revenue estimating is, is something that I strongly believe is separate from doing the expense side of it. And as we face the challenges in New Hampshire, I don't think there's anyone in that state house that isn't willing to debate each and every one of those issues. And some things, uh, you know, if you look at the waiting list for disabled children, it, it seems like the uh, it falls off the map now because mental health or DCYF or something else steps in the line. I'm not going to stop fighting for those children because I believe they should be taken care of first. And That's the wait list for services for uh, families with developmentally uh, yes, disabled. Yes, and, and I, you know, I've certainly members. been on the forefront of that, and I think it's something why I'm in Concord, quite honestly. I have to ask you and Representative Hinch this, and then I do want to go to um, you as well, Senator Susi and Representative Shirtliff. Um, are you concerned, Representative Hinch, I feel like I'm getting a little hint of that, that with Democrats in charge, there will be a tendency to um, focus more on spending and less on um, reductions. I can only go by past history with all due respect. And, and you know, uh, my experience in the past with budgets has been that, that uh, you know, there were, were a number of spending initiatives that were there. And then it was kind of, well, let's find the revenues to justify it. Uh, we need to make sure that we are in agreement that the revenues are realistic, that they are taking uh, into um, uh that they're looking at the future and and if the economy starts to get soft at all, that we're alert to that as well too. Uh, And we have to, just like you at home, when you get your paycheck every week and you say, okay, well, I can pay this, this, and this, well, that's all you can pay uh, unless you want to bounce your checks. So we need to control the budget that way too. Representative Shirtliff, go ahead. I can see you want to jump in. Well, I was just going to say it causes somewhat of a dilemma for us uh, in the Democratic Party in the House. Uh, last week, I met with the Commissioner of Department of Environmental Services. And last year, we passed a bill, House Bill 1104, that reduced the timeline for getting wetlands permits, which caused the department to need to hire more people to process those permits faster. And there's a bill in this session to raise the fees. And now, now they haven't been raised for 11 years. And um, the, the revenue is, gen- is obviously needed. Um, and I spoke to the governor about this yesterday, this, this concern that now we see this need, the developers support the fee increase, but now will our friends across the aisle say, well, they go the Democrats, they raise the fee. And it causes somewhat of a quandary, but at the end, we'll do what is right for the people in so New Hampshire. So that fee is necessary to comply with a law that the legislature passed. Right. In order exactly. to not have um, the monies come from the general fund. Exactly. Go ahead, Senator Susie. I was just going to say that when we prepare the budget, each time we do it, we look at priorities. But we look at our departments through and through to see that we're providing the services that are most in need. And I think at different times, uh, different priorities rise a little bit higher on the list. Um, with respect to revenues, I would just say that um, it's clear, given the size of the surplus, more than $100 million um, to me, that the estimates that were provided were very conservative. And I think what we need to make sure is that our revenue estimates are, in fact, realistic. All right. I want to remind our listeners that you can join us. The exchange number, 1-800-892-6477. Today in the exchange, it's a legislative preview. We're talking with four top lawmakers from the House and Senate asking about what their top priorities will be this session. In addition to the state budget, lawmakers will likely debate 
issues concerning marijuana, guns, voting laws, and so forth. Let's hear from you. Our number, 1-800-892-6477. Send us an email, exchange at NHPR. Dot org. And uh, Senator Susi, I think you mentioned at the beginning child welfare. We received a question from a listener, Mike, before the show, who asks, what are you going to do to respond to the needs of children harmed in the DCYF crisis? DCYF standing for Division of Children, Youth and Families. Mike, thank you for the question. And I'd love to hear from all of you on this, especially because, as you know, the state's child advocate, Moira O'Neill, released her first annual report Recently, it's not flattering. Caseloads, she says, are still way too high. She also calls for more money to help families before problems come severe. And she says in very strong language, actually, that uh, children who suffer early trauma are affected for life. So I'd love to hear from everybody on this. This is a pressing issue. But you, Senator Susie, first, I think, what should the legislature's response to this report from um, Ms. O'Neill be? I think there should be a twofold response. I think there should be a short term and then a long term that we incorporate into the budget. In the short term, uh, Senator John Morgan has introduced legislation to add caseworkers. As we know, um, there was clearly evidence that the caseworkers in our system are severely overburdened and not providing the kind of service and the attention uh, to these very vulnerable children that they should be. So we hope to enact that legislation and fast track it so that we can begin the process at HHS of hiring the additional caseworkers to try to get to a more meaningful level um, and so that our caseworkers can provide that more attentive care. In addition, I think we need to go through um, the the report, which, as you said, is very critical and line by line figure out which recommendations we can incorporate and how we're going to phase those changes in to make sure that the situations um, that occurred most recently where children actually died in custody don't happen again. I think the, the big picture issue that we need to consider in the legislature is striving for the right balance between the rights of parents and the rights of protecting these children. And I, I think um, that the report would suggest that at sometimes we've gone a little too far in supporting the rights of parents. I don't think we want to go too far the other way. I think what we need to do is sort of recalibrate the balance of those rights. Well, and um, Ms. O'Neill, again, the child advocate, says that the legislature did make an attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So she gives you guys credit for that. But it seems like, as she says, the courts and the rest of the child welfare system haven't really caught up with that. What do you think about this issue, Senator Morris? I'd love your thoughts. Well, first of all, Senator Carson proposing that we put a child advocate in there, I think, is is the beginning of what we thought needed to happen. I mean, we weren't paying attention to this. Sharon um, Carson, a Republican from yes. Londonderry, Derry, and I think? she, yeah. um, you know, what's coming out of the advocate is, is basically sunlight on the problems over there. But um, I think we have to strengthen the powers of the advocate. I think that's important. I, I think we want to hear what's going on over there. Um, we also, as we propose, putting new employees in over there. <laughs> Let's fill the jobs that we haven't filled this session. Um, I think that's an important piece that we should be looking at. And I do believe we need to have this debate on the child's rights and the parents' rights. I, I think that's an important piece. Well, um, get to what you just said a moment ago, because it's interesting, Senator Moore. Strengthen the child advocate. What powers does she not have right now that you think she should have? I think she should be getting responses from the department. I, I think it's important that as she questions how we're working through the procedures over there and our policies, that those answers come quickly. And I think everybody in the legislature wants to solve these problems. So I think the more the advocate is shining daylight on this, um, it's important to all of us. I think we're all looking for, we didn't put her in there to not find out what was going on. I can tell you that much. And I think as we find out, we're going to solve the problems. And I don't think throwing money at everything is the answer. So I constantly debate that. Well, and in terms of um, getting more staff online, you said there's positions that have been already funded that aren't filled um, as of yet. What's the holdup? What do you think? Well, I think there's several parts of the hold up there. I think we have a strong economy in New Hampshire. I think we're all working through those challenges of making sure there's housing in New Hampshire, making sure that we educate people um, so they can take these jobs. I, you know, as I listen to the family medical leave debate, is that going to drive people to take positions in government? Um, I think all those things are things that are going to be debated in this legislature to make sure we solve the problem. But ultimately, I I think what we realized, and especially through the Senate phase of this budget, is we needed some management on the outside to be looking at this, and that's what we created. Representative Shirtley? Yeah, I just want to agree with uh, Senator Morse about strengthening the office of the child advocate. 
I had a wonderful meeting uh, with uh, Dr. O'Neill and a member for her staff last week, and I'm halfway through her report, and she's made some very strong uh, recommendations, but uh, I would like to see the child advocate have a stronger voice in our court system if they want to file a friend of the court brief on behalf of a child. And uh, also this idea of uh, be, child safety being the primary mission of her, her office. All right, let's take a call. And again, our number, 1-800-892-6477. Today in the exchange, top leaders from the House and Senate join us to talk about what will be on their agenda this new legislative session. And let's hear from you. What would you put on their agenda? You can give us a call, 1-800-892-6477, or send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Trisha is calling in from Wolfboro. Hi, Trisha. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, Laura. Thank you. Sure. Um, Getting um, sticking with the the budget issue, and I'm not certain where the money comes from. I should know this, but I don't. Uh, where the money comes from for our courts? But I've seen for years. I'm a I'm a paralegal. Um, I've done um, mostly family law for 20 years, and um, also criminal defense, general civil litigation support. And we've seen. Um, you know, new courtrooms built around um, the state in the last decade, I guess. Some of them have eight courtrooms and only one judge in the building. Oh, my goodness. Um, there's, there are parents who file a parenting petition, um, and they have to wait a year before they have a substantive hearing. Meanwhile, there are, there's a child that is not seeing one of their parents. So, Tricia, you're or saying they, don't blame just the courts for this. They've been underfunded and can't handle the the legal they've burden. They've been so to underfunded. Speak. Okay, exactly. All and, right. and and the district court side as well. Somebody gets stopped for a violation and they lose their license pending a hearing, and it can take six months to get a hearing. Well, Tricia, thank you for calling. And uh, Representative Hinch, I'd love you to chime in on this as well. You know, we've been looking at HHS, maybe not hiring people, enough people. We've looked at the role of the child advocate. But what about the the court system? Well, and I think it's a very valid question. I I think, the again, the court system, like all of the other er, uh, areas of the budget, uh, are looked at and prioritized, to use Senator Susie's words. Um, and uh, and and I, I think the caller is correct. We do need more judges. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a process to go through not only with budgeting, but the uh, the recruiting and 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 uh, screening of judge candidates as well too, and and so I think that, but the governor has uh, put on uh, a, a few more judges in the past uh, sixty days or so, and and uh, so. You know, we're, we're we're taking bites out of it. Well, and every few weeks on this program, somebody talks about workforce shortages, right. whether it's, you know, the healthcare sector or education or law enforcement. So it seems like the state, Representative Hinch, is struggling with the same workforce issues. Absolutely. And going back real quickly to filling positions, um, I served on the commission as well. Um, and and I think Senator Morse is absolutely correct. Uh, putting the advocate in was essential. But at the same time, uh, we have to drill down and understand what are those day-to-day duties that the employees have? What can, what can we get rid of? What can we reprioritize um, so that uh, you know, we're working effectively because throwing money and, and saying, OK, well, great, I'm going to I'm going to put 100 more employees in there. But what are they going to do and what duties? Uh, and by the way, there are a number of positions that have not yet been filled. As Senator Susie said. Right. All right. right. We will talk a lot more after a short break. Stay with us. This is The Exchange on NHPR. This is NHPR, and as new resources are marshaled to address New Hampshire's opioid epidemic, NHPR continues its crossroad reporting project with live taping of the exchange to examine the issues at stake. Join us at the Nashua Public Library, February 7th at 6.30. Get your free tickets at nhpr.org slash events. Support for NHPR comes from your listeners and from Milne Travel presenting filmmaker Jay Craven, experiencing the highlights of European film while traveling from Prague to Budapest, October 2019. MilneTravel.com. 
and from Champlain College offering accredited degree programs designed to help adult learners accomplish their goals. Champlain.edu slash accomplish anything. Partly sunny for most of the state today, mostly cloudy, a chance of snow showers from the White Mountains north. Snowfall could be heavy at times. High temperatures today, mid-30s to around 40 degrees. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Canoy. Today, it's a legislative preview with Democratic and Republican leaders in the New Hampshire House and Senate. We're hearing about their priorities for the new year, and you can put your priorities on the table. What do you want state lawmakers to focus on this year? Send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Again, exchange at nhpr.org. Or give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. With me in studio, Representative Dick Hinch. He's House Republican leader. He's from Merrimack. Senator Chuck Morse. He's Senate Republican leader. He's from Salem. Representative Steve Shirtliff. He's Speaker of the House, a Democrat from Penacook. And Senator Donna Susi, Senate President and a Democrat from Manchester. One more time, that number, 1-800-892-6477. And all of you, right back to our listeners, and Brennan's calling from Manchester. Hi, Brennan, go ahead, you're on the air, welcome. Hey, um, I wanted to uh, ask a question relating to Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution, which states, all persons have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and the state. In the past, protection of gun ownership has been a bipartisan issue in our state. However, recently the House Rules Committee approved barring guns in the, new, in the House chamber. Um, other legislators are also pushing for legislation barring the mentally ill from bearing arms. The New Hampshire Constitution doesn't allow exemption, exemptions as all persons have the right to keep and bear arms. In light of this, I'm wondering to, what kind of uh, legislation can be passed um, that will regulate or is concerning uh, gun ownership in the state of New Hampshire, knowing that our uh, Constitution is very strict about this issue. So, Brennan, what would you like to see passed briefly, if anything? Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, leave uh, it alone. I, I, I honestly, I would leave it alone. I'm, uh, I'm a, a gun owner here in the state, and I'm actually very happy with our lack of laws pertaining to it, considering that we have one of the lowest gun crime rates in the nation. It doesn't really seem to like an issue that, you know, compared to other states that have rampant gun crime, New Hampshire is really, it's very low. All right, Brennan, um, thank you for the call. Legal. Yeah, and I want to let you know um, that we also got a comment from a listener before the program, Jonathan, who says, I'm a retired law enforcement officer, New York Police Department, Fire Department of New York, he says. Um, he agrees with you, Jonathan, uh, excuse me, Brennan, he says, leave the Second Amendment alone. Stop trying to pass off gun control as gun safety. Criminals do not obey laws. So, Thank you, Brennan and Jonathan, for that note. Um, And all of you, I did want to talk to you about this. The governor's school safety preparedness report did recommend the legislature study, not pass, but study, two specific gun measures, red flag laws and background checks. Um, To you, I think, first, Representative Mm Shirtliff, will that happen? Not necessarily the bills, because that's a whole other debate, but will you guys establish these study committees that the governor's school safety um, task force recommended you do? Yeah, let me just preface my remarks by saying I've been a licensed hunter in New Hampshire for over 50 years, uh, NRA hunter safety. Uh, I own long guns and handguns. for over 35 years in law enforcement, I carried a firearm. So I'm not anti-gun, but I do believe in gun safety. Um, I thought the governor's report was good. One thing, we have a bill coming in. Uh, the attorney general ruled that the federal gun safety, school zone safety legislation did not, could not be enforced by local authorities. And so we have a bill coming up this year to out, uh, ban uh, guns in school areas. Uh, that's good. We have a, ba- a bill for a 30, uh, three-day waiting period if you buy a gun at a gun show uh, with our high, uh, rising suicides and number of domestic violence. Half our murders are domestic violence related. We support that. And uh, there's other legislation along that line. And it is, it really is gun safety and not gun control. Um, the caller also mentioned about the House. We did ban firearms in the House chamber. Um, I think a lot of us had a concern about uh, the fact that the number of school children that come in there to listen to us, to have firearms near them. We've had incidents of people dropping their weapons, uh, House members. Heaven forbid that should happen in front of a child. What about, um, Representative Shirtliff, the uh, governor's task force on school safety recommending that you set up 
two um, that you set up two study committees on these two specific measures: red flag laws and background checks. You know, we have a bill uh, now for red flag and uh, in the background bill as well uh, uh, by Representative Rogers here in Concord. I support the passage of the uh, the background check uh, for gun show sales, and on the red flag bill, I, I think there are some questions. It's a bill that's already been filed and uh, by Representative Ashler. Uh, it may need to be studied because there's so many parts to it. One of those is dealing with those suffering from mental illness. And um, we want to make sure that there is a mechanism that, that is flagged, that they aren't buying guns. But we also want to make sure that if they've got treatment that has reduced that issue, that there's a way to get off any list. Senator Morris, what do you think? Well, I agree with the caller. I mean, I, I think New Hampshire has been a very safe state, and I think the uh, basically um, we're talking about criminals here. If we want to strengthen laws on that end of it, I think we should. But the um, the reality of the way we've controlled New Hampshire and following the Constitution on this issue is extremely important. Um, I spend most of my time talking about budgets, but um, when you get into policy issues, I... I think the uh, the caller was exactly right. Um, we're trying to fix something that isn't broken. Um, I certainly was adamant that I put a friend on that committee that the governor had. Um, he attended all the meetings. That's the school safety. The task school force. safety. Um, you know, he's on the school board in my local community. He, you know, he doesn't act like a Republican or a Democrat, and he certainly went through the debates. And they had many things they brought up. And you know, that this legislature is going to study everything. Um, it's what they do. And um, I don't have any problem with study committees, but I don't think there's laws at this point that need to be changed. Brennan, thank you for the call. Again, you can join us at 1-800-892-6477 or send us an email if you'd like, exchange at nhpr.org. All of you, we've got lots of feedback from our listeners well before we went on the air. Let's hear a little bit from a listener who left a voicemail um, about marijuana legalization. Hi, this is Katie, and I'm from Durham, and I want to know whether we have the uh, votes and the inclination in the legislature this time finally to legalize marijuana so that we can try to get revenue into this state instead of having it go to our neighbors. Okay, Katie, thank you for the call. Referencing the fact that, as you all well know, all of New England's neighbors will soon have um, legalized marijuana sales up and running. It's already legal on paper, but there's some of them are still uh, working out the kinks. I'd actually like to hear from everybody on this. So Representative Hinch, I'll start with you. Do you favor New Hampshire legalizing marijuana? Yes or no? Um, I still want to look at the legislation that's coming out. Uh, I believe that the question, the question that was posed, do we are the votes there? And I suspect based upon the composition of the House and the Senate that they probably are there to pass it. Um, but, you know, I want to drill down. I have not previously been a supporter of this. Um, and I want to have a very clear understanding because to me it flies in the face of the uh, heroin opioid uh, crisis that we have in the state. Um, and I served uh, as a co-chair on that commission with Senator Bradley the, in, the testimony that we heard was compelling um, and that it was a gateway drug. I understand that there's certainly some differences from the commission that studied it last year. Uh, and so, um, you know, I want to look at it a little bit more. So, um, but the question really is, are the votes there? And it feels like times are changing and the votes are there. So concern that um, legalizing marijuana would be unhelpful in the midst of this opioid crisis. That's what you're worried about. Absolutely correct. Hinge. Yes. Yep. So there's a bill um, by Rennie Cushing, a Democrat from the House, that takes the opposite tack. Uh, Representative Cushing says, I'm quoting here, that um, relating to the use of cannabis is that rather than being a gateway drug to opioids, um, he says marijuana, in fact, is pr proven to be an exit drug. So he's got a bill, actually, to um, use marijuana as uh, a qualifying condition for access to the state's medical marijuana program. So it seems like there's a lot we're sort of sorting through here. Um, first on the legalization question, though, how do you feel about it, um, Senator Susi? I still have some questions. I know the study committee really went through all of the details that other states have tried to grapple with. Um, you know, Colorado being one of the first. And there were issues around things that I don't think we talk about enough, like banking. 
um, and how you can make purchases with credit, which you can't. Um, State of Colorado had to establish its own bank um, to deal with it. So That's because so it's there federally are, illegal and correct. banks won't touch that with a 10-foot pole. That's correct. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's an interesting issue because it's not a partisan issue. Um, I, I agree with Representative Hinch. I do think that the votes are probably there in both bodies. Uh, but I think it's something that still will continue to be debated, will not fall along partisan lines. Um, and I, you know, I, I do believe the majority of the people of the state are there, so we'll likely see passage. And then the question becomes whether or not the governor can sign the legislation. Well, it's interesting because the House, I believe, has passed legalization before. And yet I'm hearing some caution, Senator Susi, from both you and Representative Hinch. Not so sure if you want to jump on this bandwagon or not. Well, I, I have not read Representative Cushing's bill. It's a House bill. Um, to my knowledge, there isn't anything in the Senate other than issues around continuing to uh, provide greater access to medical marijuana. Um, but in terms of full legalization, I, I, I do think there are some important details that we need to make sure we fully understand before we would implement it. Well, I want to get everybody on the record on this, on this full legalization issue. So how about you, um, Representative Shirtliff? The bill came up last year, and uh, I voted against it at that time because— You voted against it. Yeah, the commission was still doing their work, and the chair of that commission, Pat Abrami, asked the the body to wait to let them finish, and a courtesy to them, I did. I think the votes are going to be there this year to pass it. We came very close last year. Um, We know that uh, Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Canada has legalized uh, marijuana— I'm concerned about our residents going out of state and then possibly driving back to New Hampshire under the influence. That's a great concern. Um, So I do think it's going to pass this year, and I think uh, uh, that we should start making sure that when we implement it, all the rules and regulations are there. And one other thing I wouldn't mind seeing is the possibility of the state being the one to distribute marijuana as we do alcohol. And not so much as a revenue source, but just so we have the control over how much THC is in the marijuana that's being purchased and um, and just the environment that people are going oh, into. Oh, that's interesting. New Hampshire is one of 16, 17, 18 states that still controls the sale of alcohol. So you're suggesting if we go there, put marijuana it's in that same to um, look at, framework. Absolutely. That we look at doing that. Uh, Representative Hinch, I can see you want to jump in. Senator Morris, I just want to know your feelings about marijuana legalization. Yeah, I've never supported legalization of marijuana. And I think, you know, following other states around us has never been New Hampshire's uh, way of doing things. I think we've always led. So the reality is I wouldn't support legalizing. And I don't believe the votes are there to override a governor's veto. So In the Senate. In the Senate. Yeah, so that's been the I case before know. too, right, uh, Senator Morris? Yes. Well, I th- the Senate, I mean, traditionally has – been split pretty good on this issue. So I, I think it'll still be split. But I think, you know, looking for the votes to override a veto won't be there. And uh, the governor's promised that he would veto that bill. Representative Hinch, I can see you have one more thought here. Well, and I think the thought was that, um, and I heard the response from uh, uh, Representative Cushing that it's not a gateway drug, it's a exit drug. And, and I actually heard that last night on, on Channel 9 as well. Um, Again, I go back to what what I witnessed during the task force. Um, but I have to say that, you know, I've moved a little bit through the years as well too because um, I was not – several years ago, I was not in favor of medical marijuana and and I've moved and I think that there are certain conditions that, that do uh, justify it. Um, but I share Senator Morse's concern that – that, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for. All right. Let's go back to our listeners. And Katie, again, thank you for raising that point. It is definitely already in play at the legislature. Our number, 1-800-892-6477. Send us an email if you'd like, exchange at nhpr.org. And in addition to listening to our show today, you can watch it on Facebook Live. Let's go, all of you, to Plymouth, where Jonathan is calling in. Hi, Jonathan. You're on the air. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, if lawmakers want to keep young people in the state, um, they should really be thinking about lowering the cost of higher education. So I want to know, how are you going to reduce the cost of higher education? Are you going to increase public funding or reduce tuition? Wow, this comes up every budget year, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Senator Morris, I'm going to go to you first. Yeah, sure. I I don't think it's a funding issue on our end. I think the debate should be on the system 
making sure that they make affordable college. I mean, you're seeing that throughout the country where university after university after university is debating what they need to charge to and order to make sure that students are still coming. So I think that debate I welcome right now because we're seeing it everywhere. And as we debate everything that we're debating on businesses right now, I think businesses play a key role on the debt that's out there in society right now with universities, with with student loans. And the um, I think, you know, I brought it up in a meeting I was in yesterday about family leave. The reality is the challenges that the employees at some companies face are paying off student debt. You know, they're not worried about family leave. So as we have these debates and we, we talk about issues, I think businesses are stepping up. I think they see that these young people that are coming out of college with debt need help, and that's where they're paying attention. We've got the head of the um, UNH coming in in about two weeks. And um, in the past, UNH presidents have always said, look, New Hampshire has the lowest or second lowest um, state grant in the nation. That's part of the reason why uh, our tuition is so high. How would you respond to that, Senator Morris? Yeah, I think we've, we made that response last year in the budget. I mean, or two years ago in the budget. I, I think when we started to produce scholarships, which I think is where the state of New Hampshire should head, it give people choice, let them decide on the system that they want to participate in, whether it's community college, the university system, private colleges, um, but stay in New Hampshire. That should be the ultimate goal. Go ahead, Senator Susie. I just want to reemphasize, we are dead last in what we contribute we to back higher and forth education. With, uh, Vermont. Yeah. Um, currently, we are at the bottom of the heap. And I do think that the university system has stepped up um, and is looking to try to ensure that each of the colleges in the system is doing what it can to attract more students, to reach certain benchmarks. Um, And to achieve efficiencies within the system, whether it's through more centralized purchasing and procurement. Uh, So there have been a number of things that the university system itself has done to uh, better ensure that it's providing um, a quality, cost-effective product. Uh, But the other side of that, as Senator Morse mentioned, uh, New Hampshire students are straddled with more debt than students in other parts of uh, the country. And we need to do more, I think, on our end to try to make sure that we are providing access to scholarships and to uh, products that will allow students to be able to get uh, get a quality education and do it without having the burden for decades after of facing that debt. Well, Jonathan, thank you for the call. And we also received a question from a listener before the show, Julie, who asked us, how is the legislature fully funding the 10-year mental health plan so all areas of the plan are funded for comprehensive improvement to treatment? Um, Thank you, Julie, for raising that. And I know we talked about that at the beginning of the show, and I think all of you mentioned um, mental health. But go ahead. um, How about you first, Representative Shirtliff? Um, The last 10-year mental health plan wasn't fully funded, um, not even close. So some people said, look, if we had funded the last plan, we might not have some of the problems that we see today. You know, we really got to find the money to fund the plan. Um, as a kid walking to school, I used to walk across the New Hampshire hospital grounds. And uh, little did I know that a few years later, my bro- own brother would be a patient at the New Hampshire hospital. And I remember this was in the early 60s and uh, and how depressing just being there was. And uh, and like, as I said earlier, we did the right thing. We deinstitutionalized. And my brother Tim had a full and enriched life when he got the right medication. Um, it saddens me to see that half of our prison population have been diagnosed with mental health problems. And I think we're just reinstitutionalizing again in the state prison system. The money we could save by not spending $34,000 to house somebody in the state prison, I think that could help go to its funding. All right. Well, prisons, mental health, we'll definitely talk about that after a short break because I want to hear from others on this as well. And you can keep calling. Thank you for all those calls already. Our number, 1-800-892-6477. So coming up, we'll definitely talk about mental health. We also got a question from a listener about the minimum wage and another question from a listener about the federal shutdown, how it's affecting New Hampshire. So all that's coming up. Stay with us. This is The Exchange on NHPR. Keep calm and carry on, a popular slogan for the British in World War II. How's that working with Brexit? 
More than a million Americans work for British companies. What does Britain leaving the European Union mean for those workers and for America's relationship with Europe? Next time on 1A. That's This Morning at 10 here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from your listeners, and support also comes to us from the New Hampshire Liquor and Wine Outlets, presenting Wine Week January 21st through the 27th, a listing of wine tastings and events at nhwineweek.com. And from the Courier Museum of Art, presenting Myth and Faith in Renaissance Florence in its final week on view, closes Monday, January 21st. Details at courier.org. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Kanoy. Tomorrow on our show, two newly elected members of the Executive Council join us. That's tomorrow on The Exchange. This hour, we're talking with top Democrats and Republicans about their priorities this new year and new legislative session. And we're hearing from you. Send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Again, exchange at nhpr.org. Respond on Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange. Or give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. And in addition to listening to our program today, you can watch it on Facebook Live. Our guests are Senator Donna Susi, Senate President, a Democrat from Manchester, Representative Steve Shirtliff, Speaker of the House, a Democrat from Pennacook, Senator Chuck Morse, Senate Republican Leader, and he's from Salem, and Representative Dick Hinch, he's House Republican Leader, and he's from Merrimack. One more time, that number for you to join us, one 800 Eight nine two six four seven seven, And uh, just before the break, all of you, we were talking about mental health, responding to a question from Julie, who wanted to ask about fully funding the 10-year mental health plan. This is the new 10-year mental health plan. Um, Senator Morris, I know you've looked a lot at these issues as well, and I just wonder what you think about Julie's question. Well, first of all, I think everyone in this room's looked at it, and I, I do believe there's strong bipartisan support to solve problems. But let me just point out things that happen in government that just drive me bananas. You know, I, I don't think this room, you know, when it comes to Representative Kirk leaving the budget on the House side, uh, you probably got people clapping, and you got people like me that say, "Boy, institutional knowledge just went out the door." Um, but you know, the beds that we're talking about with mental health and hospitals and the states being sued on. Right Right now, it was it was Representative Kirk that had a plan, and he and he put it forward, and we had bipartisan support on it. Um, he presented that in the House with bipartisan support to solve some of these problems, and then we went out, and the same hospitals that are suing us today didn't want to provide some of the DRF beds. So as we get DRF is what uh, uh, the designated receiving beds, gotcha. and and I, I know Senator Susi now being in the position that I was in will be updated on this every day. You know how many people are in the hallway in a hospital, and it's wrong. It shouldn't happen. The governor and I both visited hospitals to see this happen and said we wanted to solve problems. Um, but the same institutions that we need help from to solve the problem are now suing the state. I think that's part of the complications. We, we need to find a better way to help these people. Um, I firmly believe mental health is, is a huge problem in society right now. You know, when a Supreme Court justice marches around the state and, and makes it known about the troubles that he had with his own son and, and wants to make everybody aware of things, it's, it just brought light to something that you needed to bring light to because I think all of us have probably seen it in our families, in our friends, and I, it's a, we need to solve the problem. But what I'm – I guess my challenge is it's going to take all of us to solve the problem. And as we talk about money and what level of funding to be at, (laughs) we tried to have a level of funding to help these people not be in hospitals in this last budget. I don't – it wasn't even spent because the hospitals wouldn't agree to a number to solve the problem. So what you're referring to, for listeners who might not understand, is that um, hospitals are now suing the state for this issue of having people, as you say, wandering the halls, people in mental health crisis in the emergency rooms. And the hospitals are saying, um, you know, come on, state, step up, give us a place to put these people so that they're not in the our The hospitals were the ERs. solution originally so that everyone understands it. We had hospitals that wanted these beds, North Country and the west of the state, all over. Um, then when it came time with the appropriation, um, nobody wanted to take the beds. I'm, I'm all for not leaving these people in hospital waiting rooms because it's dangerous. So I think we need a solution. Go ahead, Senator Susie. Well, I think the, the more short-term issue is the long stays that these people are encountering at the hospitals. And what the hospitals are complaining about is 
not that they are just caring for these people and the cost of doing it, but that the state isn't living up to its obligations to ensure that there is that transition so people go from the hospital to the state hospital or a more appropriate level of service. So I think we do need to look at the 10-year plan. I think we all agree there are parts of it that are very important that we need to fund. I do think in the short term there are some things we can do. Represent, uh, Senator Rosenwald has a bill to increase behavioral health rates. Um, Senator Sherman also has a bill to look at more immediate concerns and providing funds for the hospitals that are seeing these people stay, and also the issue of due process, affording these people an opportunity to uh, have a hearing and determine what their status is, and then move them into the system. The fact of the matter is the system that uh, Speaker Shirtliff spoke about was a system where we had community-based services, and that system was perhaps the best in the country, those services eroded and went away. So what we're in the process of doing is rebuilding that community base of services. And there isn't enough there. And that's why people are getting trapped in hospitals for too long. So we have some short-term goals that I think we can achieve to help relieve some of the pressure in this bottleneck. But in the long term, we need to restore that level of care. That means transitional housing for these folks. That means making sure that in the communities where they they live, um, they're getting the appropriate level of services they need. Well, speaking of um, people's status and appropriate placement, um, in his inaugural address, Governor Sununu got a cheer from both sides, I think, um, for his proposal to create a new psychiatric unit for Granite Staters who have not committed crimes but are considered by reason of their mental illness a danger to themselves or others and therefore can't stay at the state hospital. Right now, as you all know, um, these folks are housed at the secure psychiatric unit at the state prison. Their families say this isn't right. They haven't committed a crime, but they're being treated like criminals. Anybody have any idea, you know, how much this might cost to build and then to staff or what the legislature is thinking about this uh, proposal for a new unit for um, psychiatric patients? Uh, Representative Shirtliff? I've heard a price of $44 million if it's built on the grounds of the New Hampshire Hospital in the Gallon uh, Office Park. Uh, uh, there's another talk about possibly uh, going to Manchester, having it there, but uh, we've got to wait and see. Um, it could be uh, good for New Hampshire in some respect, and so far it's no longer on the co- correctional property grounds. So federal money that now is not coming into New Hampshire could, because now it's going to be in a hospital setting. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and uh, we will definitely see how that plays out as the year goes along. I know it's still early. We got an email from Anna in Keene who says, over the past decade, the state has reduced revenues due to local commun- due to local communities while shifting expenses and costs down to municipalities. Anna says, millions in revenues withheld from schools, towns, and counties, pushing the expenses down to the local taxpayers. Every time the state legislature cuts the budget, local property taxes go up. What will this legislature do to help relieve local property tax burdens? Anna, thank you so much for the question. And uh, Representative Hinch, Let's hear from you. Boy, we hear this from cities and towns all the time. We're tired of all that downshifting from those state lawmakers. Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting comment as well, too, because uh, my recollection of the last four years of budgets is that there's been no downshifting whatsoever to the local communities. So um, I'm, I, I differ with that a little bit. Uh, had there in the past, yes. Um, but uh, the last four years, uh, there was no downshifting at all. There was some um, some broader programs that still haven't been restored to what they used to be. For example, the sharing of the pensions for public employees and so forth. That's still a hit for cities and towns. Sure. So that may be what she's talking about. Um, do you want to jump in on this? How about you, sure. Senator Susi? Um, I'd be happy to. Uh, one of the pieces of legislation that we are also hoping to fast track is to do what we call um, suspend and stabilize the business tax reductions. So leave the business taxes at the current rate um, so that they are not reduced one further time uh, and use that savings, that money that we would have otherwise gone to some of the largest businesses in the state and use that for property tax relief, direct well, property tax relief for cities and towns. I'm glad you mentioned business taxes because we do need to talk about that. So let's just sort of set the table for people. And um, Senator Morris, I'll turn to you first, but really want to hear from everybody. Just remind us, um, Senator Morris, what these business taxes, tax cuts are um, and whether they're going to continue to go down. I think we're talking about business enterprise tax and business profits tax, correct? Those are the two taxes you're talking about today. And, and you know, my belief on, on the program we've put in place, I mean, obviously we've driven up wages in the state of New Hampshire. Unemployment's at a record low. 
um, this economy is doing well because of what we designed. And as we debate what the surplus is, there's many things going on there. Um, there's our tax reductions. There's the federal tax reductions. Um, the fact that New Hampshire is open for business. And anything that works against that message, I, I think, would be wrong in New Hampshire. I, I certainly believe, you know, where we are at going to 7.7% on the business profits tax and taking the BET to 6%, which it's at right now this year, um, I, I think that's important. I, you know, businesses want consistency, and that's the message we sent to them. That's why this economy is outliving economies in other parts of the country. Um, we certainly heard in this joint um, Ways and Means Finance meetings that the House held um, that we need to be careful going forward. Um, I think what we need to learn is from 2007 to 2010, 100 increases in taxes and fees hurt the economy in New Hampshire. We were the last ones to come out of a bad economy in the Northeast. I don't want to see that again. Go ahead, Representative Hinch. Yeah, I agree with Senator Morrison. And business leaders are looking for steady and predictable economy, economic picture, um, and um, being able to uh, project, um, you know, um, for an extended period of time, what their, their business is going to be looking like. Uh, to to uh, say that we're going to freeze the the business taxes at a certain level, and now we're going to use that money to shift it over um, to you know another uh, need um, is forgetting that the business community. Uh, is a critical part of the the economy successes that we've had. So, so you guys would say keep these business tax reductions in place. Um, I want to get our Democrats in 100%. as well, but <laughs> so, but just remind us, um, uh, Senator Moore. So, the business enterprise tax are those cuts done? Is that are they down at the level where you guys wanted them, or is there one more cut to come? There'll be an additional cut in the in the future to go to 7.5 on the on the BPT and to 5.0 on the BET. Um, I don't even think the interim one that's going in place right now is being acceptable um, for what I saw Senator D'Alessandro say. Um, so to get to the numbers I suggested, that's what's going in this year. Um, you know, businesses are expecting that to happen. And I, th I think it should happen. And, and to address the caller, just so everyone understands. The downshifting. The downshifting. You know, I do believe when we look at the education dollars that are going back to our communities, um, we need to look at that. Senator Stiles and, and, and Senator Rausch, you know, four or five years ago put that plan in place. The money was going to follow a student. And certainly because the House was going to grab the fund that was helping the communities that really needed it, we came up with a plan. I'm all for putting the money back into those communities that really need help. Um, and I just think the House and the Senate need to agree on that. I, I, but I, I, I think there's legislation maybe in both bodies on looking at that. But to open up school funding models um, in the state of New Hampshire would be a big problem. Well, that's definitely a show down the road. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about that today, but I think I want to stick with this business tax cut um, debate for a moment because this is a big deal. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Susi, it seems like some Democrats say, OK, let's keep the cuts that are in place now but not go further. Other Democrats are saying, no, no, let's roll back these cuts and go back to where we were a couple years ago. Right. So as I said, the Senate Democrats uh, support suspend and stabilize. So keep the tax rate as it is currently. Okay, so, so don't make it higher. understands what it is. Don't make it higher. Uh, just going forward, we won't allow for those additional cuts. But what we will provide for is direct property tax relief, which also applies to businesses. Businesses are property taxpayers in this state. So to the extent that, you know, we don't see the rate go down going forward, if they're seeing their property tax rates going down, we're still benefiting businesses all the way. Um, that's what we intend to do and to make sure that individual homeowners see a bit of relief as well. Um, I have to turn to you too, Representative sure. Shirtliff. Um, this will not be a great talking point for Democrats the next time they run. Republicans will say, hey, Democrats uh, voted to raise your taxes. Yeah, no matter, even if we don't, we'll probably hear that. So uh, that's not surprising. But uh, I know the House Ways and Means Committee is studying this issue now. And going back to this issue of downshifting, uh, last month I stepped down from the Concord City Council after 11 years. And I can remember in 2011, 2012, when the state downshifted the Group 2 and teacher retirement to the city of Concord, which cost us 
over a million dollars, the 25% that they had promised to pay. Uh, that's the equivalent of a 3% property tax increase. We didn't increase property taxes, but we cut debt back on paving and other city services. So this issue, whenever we reduce revenue, there's always a ripple effect, it seems, at the other end. And we want to be very cognizant that we're not going to downshift. We've been to, oh, go ahead, Senator Morris. Yeah, I just want to bring it up because we went back to 2011. Governor Lynch was the one that eliminated that payment. And I remember I that. supported it was a huge him in doing it because we passed Senate Bill 3, which we put in the budget at that time, which certainly set a new structure on the funds that we were putting into the retirement system, which put them in a better position locally than they would have been in if we had gone status quo. So I, I think we've controlled that for years, and, and I think we better be very careful where we go there. Well, speaking of businesses and um, their needs and their desires, Governor Sununu and Governor Scott of Vermont are holding a news conference in Littleton later today on what they call a new bi-state initiative. WMUR reports um, that they're going to roll out a two-state family leave plan, a public-private partnership that both public and private employees could access, run by a private entity. Now, no details until later today, but um, what do you think, Representative Hinch? Is this something that the state should pursue? Um. I think that uh, it's worth looking at. Um, I want to the the devil is always in the details, and I just want to make sure that again this is something that is business friendly um, and does not um, uh, strap the backs of the business community, business owners, and and so uh, unlike last year's program. Uh, that were absolutely was an income tax uh, due to the mandate and all that. You know, um, I think we need to look at it. Um, and so I'll, I'll reserve until I see the final product. Well, and again, the details won't be released right. until later. What right. elements of this um, would you like to see, Representative well, Shetliff? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, last session, which was a Republican-dominated session, we in the House passed the Family Leave Bill three different times uh, with uh, strong bipartisan support. As for the governor's meeting today, yesterday myself and Senator Susi had an hour-long meeting with the governor, and Senator Susi brought up the issue of family leave and the two bills, the one in the House and one in the Senate. The governor never mentioned that he was meeting with the Governor Scott, and I wish he could have told us more about what he was planning to do. I found out by reading the online WMUR news link, and that's how I heard about the meeting. All right. Well, all of you, I hope you come back because there's lots that we need to look at. The mental health plan, I'd love to dig into education funding a little bit more with you. We didn't even get into um, some of the other questions that will come up in the budget and so forth. And then, of course, once we have this family leave proposal, you can come back and talk about it. Good. So thank you all very much for being here. Representative Hinch, good to see you. Thank you for your time. You as well. Thank you. That's Dick Hinch. He's House Republican leader. He's from Merrimack. Senator Morris, always good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. That's Senator Chuck Morris. He's a Republican from Salem. Uh, Representative Shirtliff, thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure. Steve Shirtliff, he's Speaker of the House, a Democrat from Pennacook. And uh, Senator Susi, thank you also for being here. Thanks again, Laura. That's Senator Donna Susi. She's Senate President, a Democrat from Manchester. You're listening to The Exchange on New Hampshire Public Radio. The views expressed in this program are those of the individuals and not those of NHPR, its board of trustees, or its underwriters. If you missed part of today's program, listen to The Exchange anytime at nhpr.org or subscribe to our podcast. Search Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Stitcher for NHPR Exchange.